Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 299, featuring the third installment of my interview with Dr. Richard Bartle, the co-creator of MUD, the game that got the massively multiplayer online gaming genre started. In this part of the interview, we talk about other MMOs. I think you'll be really intrigued uh, what Richard thinks about the current MMO landscape and how it compares to uh, his original game and his original vision for the future of that genre. A lot of great stuff, and we've got a lot to cover. So, without further ado, here is Dr. Richard Bartle. Yeah, I saw League of Legends was trying something new with that. I don't know if you saw that news item, but apparently they got a very toxic community of players and they're trying to implement you don't say <laughs> they're trying to implement some kind of way for other players to have a little control i suppose yeah well um it's quite easy to get players to have control um you just put in payment permadeath permadeath is great <laughs> with permadeath if somebody uh, gets on the wrong side of you then you can just uh, get you and your buddies to kill them unfortunately Although there are many, many things that permadeath is very good at, it's it, it's got one thing that um, means no one uses it, and that's the fact that although everyone's quite pleased to see other people um, lose their characters, they don't like it when it happens to them. They really, really don't like it, and as in they cry and, and punch holes in the, the, the screens. I mean, they do not like it. Um, so uh, permadeath isn't a thing anymore, but back then permadeath was a thing and you could, if somebody was um, coming along and following you around and calling you a jerk and doing all sorts of things, then you think, you know, I'm sufficiently provoked that I may well risk my own character to take you down, you bastard. <laughs> so, they, so they would. Um, and if you were a good player, it wouldn't take you all that long to get back to where you were. Uh, and I mean, when you talk permadeath to people these days, I think, but if I, my character died, then, you know, I'd, I, I'd die five times a night. Well, no. I mean, characters would last for three months without getting killed. And when they did get killed, it was because you had made a mistake yourself. You had thought, oh, they're down, like the enemies down. So it just takes one more hit and they'll die on you. I know I should flee, but I won't. I just, ah, no. Oh no. Three months. So <laughs> yeah. Three months. Um, but if people could get to wizard level and without being killed, which obviously they, they had to do, then it shows it's possible. So permadeath didn't happen every time you played. I mean, it did very, when you first started off and you were attacking everybody and everything and realizing that, you know, this isn't a, a winning strategy, perhaps I shouldn't be per, uh, attacking people. And after that, then you started playing it, what you call properly. Um, and then it was, um, it's really exciting. I mean, you think PVP is exciting. <laughs> PVP with permadeath <laughs> is very, very exciting. Oh, open world, wow. open PVP um, and permadeath. And why did nobody get killed? Because we didn't have enough players that you could form gangs of 50 who would go around and attack. As soon as you can get gangs of 50 who can go around and attack other people, permadeath's um, not sustainable. And that's what we have with today's MMOs. I was just wondering if anybody had ever picked on you, found out who you were in the game and you know, um, focused on killing you. Well, yeah, they did. But the, the thing is, I didn't you care. Find them. <laughs> no, 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 because I didn't, I didn't care because um, I wouldn't be playing for the same reasons that players play. I would be playing because I was a designer and I was trying to figure out what mm -hmm. uh, things about the game. You know, I, it was if I needed another character, I could just make one. But um, I, I never played it for the same kind of fun that a player of a, an MMO plays. I still don't play them for the same kind of fun that. MMO players. I play them for designer fun, not for not for player fun, and that's different. Hmm. Well, speaking of permadeath, I just just in passing was curious if you. Uh, I know you're a Pillars of Eternity fan. Yeah. Uh, did you select the permadeath option for that when you were playing it? No. <laughs> <You're> not... <laughs> that just seems insane to me. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, it took me long enough to finish the game without permadeath. Um, it did take quite a while before my character did die, but um, there aren't enough 
um, second characters to replace them. You know, you know, it, you, you, it's got the hire an adventurer at an inn thing, which you can do mm-hmm. if um, you're playing that and you've lost all the other ones. So I'll just hire a new one. But um, I wasn't playing playing for that. I wanted to um, I wanted to run like a party mechanics thing. And um, so Pillars of Eternity, yeah, that was just right. I'm, and I, as soon as I finished it, I went off and started playing Baldur's Gate again. So, oh. <laughs> which you I think it's as good as Baldur's Gate one and two. Um, Baldur's Gate two is better Baldur's Gate 1 um, yeah I quite like Baldur's Gate 1 I'm um, probably about the same the in terms of the, the narrative in terms of implementation um, the I, I much prefer the um, the one for Pillars of Eternity um, not just because it's built for modern screens but it's got some nicer um, interface options that are, that are useful things like uh, don't make me guess whether there's a door in that cave. Let me press the button and see mm-hmm. if the door shows in the cave. So I don't have to go and mouse over to try and find if there's a door there no, just, or, or an opening there. Just let, just show me. That sort of thing's useful. Um, I was a bit um, ambivalent about the stash as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it, um, I almost switched it off. The, well, not switched it off. Switched off the unlimited stash. But since the option I'd chosen had it as unlimited, and it was a while before I noticed that it was actually unlimited, um, I thought, "Oh, I'll keep on playing with that." But, yeah, it yeah. seems like it's always been the hard question for a designer: is you know, to what extent is the realism going to make it more fun, or just make it more frustrating? You know, for the, yeah. for the player, how do you make that call? Well, okay, the. The argument for having, um, we used to call it realisticness, um, because obviously it's not real because there aren't vampires and dragons, but realistic as in, if there were, then they should behave logically. Mm. Um, very similitude, you know, this is the, the reason for having these um, is essentially to do with immersion. The, um, if you're in a world and the world is behaving like the real world does, then it's easier for you to will yourself into that world. But the more obstacles it puts up, the more um, it um, blocks you by doing things which are stupid, then the more you have to will yourself to believe that this is how it should be in order to overcome it. So, yeah, my World of Warcraft warlock um, had a... um, glass of milk in her backpack for seven years still cold still fresh <laughs> didn't matter how many times she'd swum uh, underwater you know still there uh, that glass of milk um and that makes no sense now with uh with vision uh, uh, with a graphical world because about 60 percent of what human sorry to touch my eye when i said vision oh <sighs> um the because about sixty percent of what humans experience is comes through their eyes, you can um, ride roughshod roughshod over a lot of the things that um, we were doing in text worlds um, to support reality. So in a text world, things like um, I have a bag. Um, inside this bag is a box. Inside the box is a casket, and inside the casket is what I really don't want you to have. Um, so you could carry around thing, things like that and there'd be a weight limit so you couldn't carry around things which are too heavy. Um, today's MMOs didn't even have the concept of weight. You know, how much does it weigh? Uh, what's its volume? Uh, you, you play a game and, and I remember playing one and um, it was a, um, a voxel-based one, which is fairly recent, and thinking, why am I trying to make the decision of what to take out of my backpack. I've got a choice. I can either drop one leaf, which is occupying a slot in my backpack, or 99 cubic metres of ice. (laughs) Now, why does a leaf take up the same space as 99 cubic metres of ice? Now, that's... But the thing is that if you're someone who's played computer games for years and years and years, you... Uh, when you started off, that seemed a little odd. But the more you played it, the more other games did it, and more games did it. Until mm-hmm. now, that's when you play a game, you just see slots, and you don't even think that it's anything to do with reality. 
And so if something did suddenly say, you know, 99 cubic, you can carry 99 tons, can you? Uh, because that's how much 99 cubic um, meters of ice weighs. Um, if you if you stop them, they think, well, you know, that would jolt them out of their immersion. Their immersion now is a, is in not the real world, but in their experience of previous virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. So, in a virtual world, they don't notice that rooms have no doors because when they don't have doors, it, it, it just doesn't occur to them. Um, but if you add more verisimilitude, then it, it allows players more of, a, of um, a sense of not just being in the world, but of, of the depth of the world and, and, and of control. It allows for more emergent things, interactions between things. You can try something out because you think, well, that should work in real life. Um, and and I mean, there's an example in Mud... Um, Mud uh, two, which which would so so we have these two things. There was a baton and a bow, and if you waved the baton, it teleported you to where the bow was, and if you waved the bow, it teleported you to where the baton was. Um, and what players would do is, um, if if you were damaged and you wanted to get your health back, you'd have to sleep. So you wanted to sleep in a room where no one could get to you. So uh, one person, um, there, was a, there was such a room, um, but it was um, quite hard, hard to get to in the first place. What you, had, what you could do is you could take, um, say, the bow, and you dropped it down a well. When it, land, it fell down the well, when it landed in the bottom of the stream, it would float down the stream. And there was a grate at the end, which you couldn't normally get through, but because it was only a bow, it could go through there. Um, and no, 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 no the, the grate stopped. No, the grate was um, what stopped it. Um, so, it. so it comes down, goes down the river, it hits the grate, stops at the grate, uh, which is in this particular room. Um, and then you can wave the baton and it teleports you there. You pick it up. Now you've got the baton in your hand. Anybody who gets the bow can't teleport to you because you've got it. Um, and so you can sleep safely in this room. Now that was emergent. What was also emergent? If I take this keg of gunpowder and I put it in a coracle and I set fire to the coracle and I drop the coracle down the well, the coracle will float down the, um, the this underground stream while on fire. At a certain point, the fire will get hot enough that it will ignite the gunpowder. So someone's asleep, you drop a coracle with with a, a lit coracle with a gunpowder in it down, it floats down and catches on the grate and then a few seconds later, boom, and you've just killed the guy who thought you couldn't get to him. Now, I never programmed that in. Well, I programmed it in, but I didn't program... Uh, the players figured out that this is how it should work, and it did work. And that kind of depth of, um, of physics is something mm -hmm. you don't get in modern... MMOs. I mean, in, in Mud, you could things like um, I'll fill up this glass with water, this jug with water, and I've got a glass here, and I'll pour that, and I'll fill the glass up from the jug, and if it's a pint glass, this jug now has a pint less water in it. Now, you, that's we could do that on a sim, on an old, you know, four eighty six machine, and yet today's MMOs can't do that. Oh, it's not so much they can't, as they don't do that. But there's so much you can do if you've got that extra level beneath there hmm. um so eventually i think um, we'll see some more physics coming through if not that maybe some more detail at least in the ai of the month of the you know the monsters the npcs the mobiles because they're stupid compared to what they were back in the text world days as well hmm. sorry i'm starting to uh um mope now about modern MMOs and their inability to reproduce things we could do in text years ago. Uh, uh. Hey. Yeah, I was just thinking about this examples that you gave with the, you know, lighting the thing and having it yeah. float along the stream. And to me, just thinking that 
people could do something like that in a, in a game would make it a lot more appealing to me because it always there's like a whole imaginary a dimension to it that wouldn't be obvious. Uh, but it seems like you know I don't know why I'm, tr I'm trying to imagine why the modern MMOs we've got so much more memory now got mm -hmm. so much more powerful processors you know it seems like they would have even more of that kind of thing uh, but instead like you said they, they're even a lot they're, they've even uh, more limited than the you know, original yeah. mud game was in some ways i mean why is that well in part because some things have got to be animated uh, fire is generally a bad thing to have in uh, modern mmos because you've got to show something being on fire in a text world you can just say the coracle is on fire but someone's got to sh have flames coming out of an, uh, out of it and um, pouring glasses you know you've got a motion capture somebody pouring something into something else for that to work so they've got all the this extra baggage that comes with it which makes it harder yeah. to do but there are some things that they could easily do things like um uh in World of Warcraft, sometimes in when you're uh, uh, starting out, you see um, rabbits going around and wolves will kill, kill the rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> oh, that sounds quite good. So if I wanted to kill a wolf, then maybe I should try and um, set up a rabbit so the wolf goes to the rabbit and then I can kill it at range. Oh, I can't get a rabbit but there's a crazy cat lady there and she's got a ton of cats. Can I just buy a cat from her and go out and release the cat near a wolf and then stay and the wolf will go for the cat and then I can... Well, no, you can't because you can't release your cat and even if you do, it doesn't get eaten. The cats are invincible. So that's something you could have done. You know, something <laughs> you'd, you could want actually... to, you'd want to buy cats and use them to, as bait for yeah, the wolf. Yeah, as bait. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Poor cat. It's a cat. It's got it coming. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But think just things. I mean, that doesn't involve any extra animation or anything. All it involves is um, an ability to do what seems to be common sense. You know, mm. other things that they that we used to have things like weather. You have weather in MMOs today, but very often it's very infrequent that it actually has any effect. You you walk around. Uh, an MMO at night and everybody is still awake everyone's wearing the same clothes in the day it's mm -hmm. tipping it down with rain they're wearing the same things why have the weather if if people are immune to weather mm -hmm. so these are, these are again things I mean sometimes you, you do um, there are some MMOs that have seasons I think um, Saga of Rhizome had seasons so there's places you could only get to um, every four game months which is probably something like every three game three real days or something maybe a week i don't know but the where there's just a cosmetic effect well why bother having it uh um, because it, it, and it's 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 not just so much a you know we'll have it just to, for our atmosphere but you could actually give it teeth and other things um being able to swim across rivers while wearing plate armor. Now, that's <laughs> yeah, that's not something you really should be able to do. And and if plate armor floats, because it's it's like magic magic um, plate armor. Well, okay, uh, but then <laughs> I mean you've you've just. You've, you've like ruined the world. I mean, you're just saying magic for everything that you can't explain. It's not got any consistency to consistency mm -hmm. to it. It's just a, so yeah. These are things which today's MMOs can't do, mainly for reasons of expense. Often for reasons of the designers didn't know they could do it, um, and um, there is some um, I wouldn't say laziness, but um, complacency as in why do it if we don't need to do it i mean people mm. play these games anyway so i need to but if somebody did come up with uh, an mmo which did have a high degree of physics which did need some more thinking about things then you can see how it might attract some of the people who've played mmos and and, and left because they no longer do the business people who are looking for more worldly worlds <laughs> And...
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Of course, we've got episode 300 coming up uh, next episode. I've been uh, trying to imagine, trying to think of some different fun things to do for that episode. I've asked a few special guests. I haven't heard back from them yet, so we'll see what happens. But anyway, hopefully we'll have something very special for you for the 300th episode of Match Head. <laughs> Let me tell you, I never thought I would be making so many of these uh, Match Heads for you, but... As always, I want to thank you very much for your support. You are exactly why the show has lasted for 299, almost 300 episodes. So thank you very much for your support. If you, uh, for whatever reason, have yet uh, to step up to the plate, maybe the 300th episode coming up will be the incentive that you need to finally go over to the Patreon site and throw your buck into the pail or the hat, uh, so to speak. It only takes a few minutes, guys, and I, I really, really, truly appreciate it. It really means a lot to me, so thank you yet again. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, lots of big news this week. Uh, I don't know if you can tell if the uh, shelf looks a little different, uh, but basically I have now moved into my new accommodations, the uh, new mat cave, as it were, and it literally is in, in a basement, so it's a little more cave-like than the former setup. Uh, not everything is uh, perfect yet. I'm still designing things, constructing things, uh, arranging things, and so on and so forth, but hopefully it's not too jarring for you. I've been having a real issues trying to get the lighting right in here, but I'll continue to work on that, make some tweaks. Uh, if you guys have more experience with this sort of thing, uh, please let me know uh, what you would advise. Maybe I can send you some photos of the room and uh, you can help with the lighting setup. If not though, <laughs> if this is okay, it's okay with me. Uh, we'll just leave it like this. All right, let's see, other news. Uh, a couple big, uh, there's a Mad Chat guest, uh, Ale Alexei Pajitnov, the designer of Tetris. Now he's on for later this week. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that everything will go smoothly with that, uh, but maybe that'll be the th that'll be a pretty good topic for the 300th episode if I can get him on. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, some news from other podcasts. Uh, Adam's program, Fragments of Silicon, is going to feature Becky Berger Heinemann soon, so I thought I'd pass that along. That's slated for September 23rd, and I believe he does a live show. Uh, so that might be pretty cool if you wanted to ask Becky some questions. Uh, just write down September 23rd. I'll try to keep you posted as I hear more about this, but it's always exciting. Uh, and let's see. And Shane has interviewed Chris Perkins, a D&D story manager and dungeon master. And let's see what else. Oh, oh, <laughs> almost missed the biggest news. Uh, before I hit the big, the big news, news items, though, uh, one little thing, uh, if you've ever go to matchhat.us, the website for this pod or for this uh, show, YouTube show. Uh, there is sometimes I'll put audio podcasts up there. They're also on iTunes. Anyway, I just did a, a little five minute one to kind of experiment with a different style about uh, Will Wright and SimCity. Uh, so if you guys get a chance uh, you know, go check that out, just go to matchhat.us or iTunes, look for Matchat, and you'll see that. Uh, you know, I just kind of did that as an experiment, but you know, if you guys like it and want to want to hear more in that style, then uh, let me know. I haven't really heard much about it yet, so I don't. You know, I'm I know I'm I'm my own worst critic when it comes to stuff like this. So uh, let me know what you think about it. Okay, okay, yeah, the big announcement. Uh, Beam Dog has announced a expansion <laughs> for Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition. You heard that right, an expansion set for. The original Baldur's Gate, at least the enhanced edition of that. Uh, it's called Siege of Dragon Spear, and it's going to be done by none other than Chris Avalon. Uh, huge news, and don't even bother to type the comment yet. Yes, I've contacted Chris. Hopefully, we'll get him on the show uh, to talk, tell us about this project. Uh, but anyway, you know, it doesn't get much uh, more exciting than that. Holy cow. <laughs> really, really looking forward to seeing what that comes out. Uh, like, um, 
Anyway, go check out the website. I'll post a link to it if you want to read more about that and look at the... I think they might have a trailer posted. I didn't get a chance <laughs> to, to watch that. Hopefully I'll be able to upload this video, guys. Uh, you know, this uh, the internet keeps going down here. We had a big lightning storm here in St. Cloud, and it's just been up and down, up and down, like a yo-yo today. So all I can do is hope that we'll actually be able to upload this. <sighs> One of those days. All right, let's see about that ale of the week. Well, this week I uh, actually have a ginger beer. Uh, this is a Fentiman's Botanically Brewed Ginger Beer fermented with botanical ginger drink with, with herbal abstract, uh, herbal extracts, sorry. Fentiman's, uh, let's see, these guys are out of Canada, looks like. Burnaby, British Columbia. No, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Actually, it's I guess it's uh, they brewed it, but it appears to be for Newcastle upon Tyne, Teen, in the United Kingdom. So I guess the it, recipe must come from the UK, and then they get them to, they they brew it in Canada, Canada, and then ship it to the U.S. So quite a circuitous route. Now I don't believe uh, this has alcohol in it. It's ginger beer, so I guess it's like root beer, ginger beer. I don't think there's alcohol in this, uh, but it apparently is the uh, Doctor Who, Tom Baker's version, his uh, favorite drink, if you remember that. So I've always got my eye out for ginger beers, and I haven't tried this one yet to my knowledge. Uh, so I thought I would give this a try and see what, uh, <laughs> see what I think of it. All right, so I got some of this ginger beer, Fentiman's ginger beer. Uh, yeah, Fentiman's ginger beer and the rather excellent drinking horn. You know, I was going to post this video yesterday, and believe it or not, I couldn't find my <laughs> rather excellent drinking horn. You know, I guess it was, I, I wanted to make sure that I got over here safely, and I was paying very special attention to it, and of course, forgot where the heck I put it. And it was like, a hundred boxes up there, so, yeah. <laughs> well, I can definitely say this, you definitely smell the ginger here. It's almost, it's almost painful to, uh... You know, inhale this too strongly because it's a very concentrated ginger aroma, which I'm actually fine with that. You also smell a little bit of a kind of a Sprite-like uh, uh, aroma. Anyway, it smells really good, so let's give it a taste. Uh, <clears throat> it's very hot. If you uh, have these uh, ginger beers, you know, sometimes they can feel almost like Tabasco sauce going down. Uh, this is quite pungent. And you definitely taste the ginger. You definitely get the heat from this. It's, uh, of course, uh, very sweet as well. I actually uh, rather like this. Let me try it again. You don't want to necessarily chug it, uh, but it'd probably be good for a, a sipper. You know, that is uh, quite, quite, quite good. I don't know if it's the best ginger beer I've ever had, but it's definitely right on up there. I like the uh, the heat with this. You get a very peppery, uh, gingery taste with this. It's a very unusual. I mean, you know you're you, <laughs> you know you're not drinking a Coke or a Sprite when you uh, drink some of this Fentiman's ginger beer. Uh, I'm gonna go a four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, if you like ginger beer or you're curious about one, this might be a good one, good one to start with. It is a little bit on the hot side. It leaves a uh, I don't know if I call it refreshing, but it's definitely interesting. Uh, beverage. So uh, four out of five drinking horns for the uh, Fentiman's Ginger Beer. All right, so the quotation this week, I was looking for quotes about realism, and I found a really uh, quote, a really good quote, really made me think, uh, by Jean Cocteau. It goes something like this. True realism consists in revealing the surprising things which habit keeps covered and prevents us from seeing. So mull that one over. See you guys next week.
I feel fine. Oh, do us a favour. I can't. Well, can you hang around a couple of minutes? You won't be long.